Okay, now we're going to go to the question and answer portion of, um, of the evening. So Congressman Grayson, you can come up here and turn your microphone on. What we're going to do is we're going to, um, uh, I'm going to, I have a series of cards here just because of the time we're not going to be able to get all of them answered. But if you didn't get your question answered, please come to us afterwards and we can take down your email address on the back of your card and get you an answer to your question. So um, the first question is going to be, we're going to call your name, you're going to stand up, and we're going to bring you the microphone. Before we do any of that, I want to thank every one of you for being here today. Yeah. You're the one who deserves the applause. So. Okay, the first question is from Paul Perot. Where are you, Paul? Right here. Oh. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Congressman Grayson, historically, safety and quality of life issues like we're talking about tonight are ignored until injury or death requires the attention. Is there any way earned sick time or wages or any of these can be achieved without this requirement? And how can we help? Well, yes, and the answer is simple. We have to demand it. This is still a functioning democracy. America depends upon you and people like you to speak up, to push your elected representatives to talk about things that are real in your life the way that we've been talking about all evening today. It's up, it's up to you. Uh, you have to speak to your friends, your neighbors. They have to decide that things are more important to them than Harris Hilton and what she's up to. All right, We're, we have to get, we have to turn people's attention to things that actually matter, to wages, to benefits, to jobs, to things in our lives that actually matter to us. And it's a struggle. I mean, the media uh, makes enormous amounts of effort to distract us. There are weapons of mass distraction deployed every day <laughs> to try to keep us from focusing on the things that actually matter in our lives. We can't be fooled by that. We have to concentrate. And I think that if we do concentrate on our problems, then we can solve them. Okay. All right, next question is from Sarah Grimes. Where is Ms. Grimes? Okay. There we go. It's working. Uh, raise your hand. Stand up, Ms. Grimes. There you go. denied health care because many of the Republican states, such as Florida, have refused to expand Medicaid due to the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, this is a tragedy, uh, just by way of background. Uh, until we passed the Affordable Care Act, when I was first in Congress two years ago, uh, there were 45 million Americans who couldn't see a doctor when they are sick. I'm sure that we have some in the audience today. Uh, is there anybody here who still doesn't have health coverage yet? Please raise your hands. Okay, I see a number of hands going up. Having passed that act, we are now making progress toward the goal, which is to make sure that everyone can see a doctor who he or she is sick, and that health care is affordable for those people who rely upon private insurance. And we've made some progress in that regard. For seniors, uh, raise your hand if you're on Medicare. For seniors, we've already reached the point where the donut hole, which is the amount that seniors have to pay for prescription drugs, is half closed. And each year, it, we'll, we'll make further progress toward that goal. In two years, there'll be no more donut holes, and the government will be paying the full amount for seniors uh, drugs that they need in order to stay alive. Also for seniors, we've already reached the point where seniors don't have to pay any more deductibles or co-payments for ordinary care, like a checkup. And therefore, their need for supplemental coverage has declined, and that coverage has already gotten cheaper for most seniors. With regard to everybody else, we have now reached the point where you can get insurance if you have a pre-existing condition, and your insurer can no longer cut you off if you become too expensive. Now, I think this is a very important point. When, when I was uh, voting on the health care bill, uh, I got tired of listening to debates the last night. There were a lot of protesters outside, by the way, on both sides of the argument. And um, I just didn't want to hear any more from my fellow members of Congress, so I wandered outside. The police were a little concerned, so they gave me the police escort. And I went into the crowd, 
and I talked to people who were both for and against the bill that we were voting on. And I met a man in a wheelchair, and he said to me, I have a pre-existing condition, I can't get insurance. If you vote against this bill and this bill fails, I will die. And that struck me as being a very persuasive argument. <laughs> So now we've already reached the point where people can, if they can afford it, get the coverage that they need even if they've had cancer or if they had a stroke like my wife has had a stroke or some other condition that before meant that the insurance companies weren't interested in taking care of them because they might turn out to be too expensive. And then we had those situations where the care was expensive, it might reach a quarter of a million dollars or a half a million dollars, they would literally pull the plug on you even if you were in a coma. They can't do that anymore either. Now, we're approaching the point where we were going to have a big jump in the number of people with coverage in this country, apart from the reasons I just gave and also the fact that now uh, people can be covered under parents' coverage until they're 26 years old. Another thing that's also extended coverage. We're going to have a big jump starting at the end of this year because we're going to expand Medicaid coverage to 15 million people who didn't have it already by increasing the amount of money that you can make as working poor and still get that coverage from 133% of the poverty level to 150% of the poverty level. In addition to that, at the end of this year, which is still going to continue, uh, we're going to have what are called the affordability credits which are government mandated discounts that will mean that no matter what your income is up to $88,000 a year for a family of four, you will not have to pay more than 11% of your income for health coverage. The government will make up the difference. These affordability credits start at the end of the year. These two things, uh, together with the employer mandate and the individual mandate, which also is due to start at the end of the year, these two things would have meant that the great, great majority of the people who didn't have coverage before would have coverage by the end of this year. What's actually happening is that in Republican-controlled states like ours, in many of these Republican-controlled states, what's happening is that the governor or the legislature are refusing to implement the expansion of Medicaid, even though the federal government is paying for all of it for the next three years and then 90% of it for each year after that. In the case of Florida, we're talking about literally billions of dollars that cost us nothing. We would be paying exactly the same taxes regardless. And yet, the Florida legislature, the Republicans in charge of the legislature, said, we're not going to take the federal government's money, uh, and we're not going to put these people onto the coverage that the people of Florida will have to pay nothing to get. And there are some other states, like Texas, that have done the same thing. I think it's tragic. Here in Florida, we have 4 million people who still have no health coverage, still can't see a doctor when they're sick. It's 20% of the state, which is the third highest percentage in the entire country, and it's 40% of the Latinos here in Florida who can't see a doctor when they're sick. I'm hoping that these people are paying attention. I'm hoping that they realize that a small cabal of just a few Republicans in Tallahassee are keeping them from getting the coverage that by law they deserve. And I'm hoping that we'll see something done about that next year when we have our election here in Florida. So that's the long answer to a short question. I, you know, the sad part is we're playing games with people's lives. Statistically, for everyone who does not, every thousand people who do not have insurance in this country, one of them will die each year. We have each year 45,000 people who have been dying each year in this country because they have no health insurance. The chance of dying when you don't have health insurance is almost twice as high as if you do have health insurance. Controlling for age, controlling for gender, controlling for smoking habits, controlling for weight, Controlling for all those different variables, you're twice as likely to die if you don't have health coverage as if you do have health coverage. So I, I think it's a pity and it's a shame and it's disastrous that anybody would take any steps to prevent another person from getting health coverage. One thing you can say for sure is that every single member of the Florida legislature can see a doctor when he or she is sick. So why can't we?
Mr. John Centron, where are you? Oh. Chester Frazier. All right, Mr. Frazier. Let me get out of the question for you. No, go ahead. Everybody catches a cold. We need health care and we need it now. Okay? And our tax dollars is paying for it. And you said it's billions of dollars. Florida stands to lose $51 billion of our tax dollars that's already been allotted to come to Florida. This is not a donor state. Florida is no longer a retirement state but it's a thriving workforce. I have co-workers that's 69 years old and 73 years old that's putting and taking patients, total care patients, out of beds. They're gonna either end up straight in the cemetery or in one of those beds. It's un-American and it's unacceptable. Yeah, I have to agree 100%. Uh, My mother lives here in Florida, and she got very upset when she heard that the governor had turned down a billion dollars uh, for high-speed rail a couple of years ago, which I actually fought to bring to Florida. I sat down with the Secretary of Transportation and found out exactly what we need to do to bring that money here, because money is jobs. And one of my proudest accomplishments the first time I was in Congress was that we doubled the amount of competitive grant money that was coming into the district for our competitive grants program. Imagine what it's like not to throw away a billion dollars, but $50 billion. And that is exactly what the governor is doing over the course of the next several years. And the state legislature is his collaborator in that regard. Now, with regard to your other point, uh, one of the fundamental accomplishments of what we call Obamacare is the fact that it actually requires certain services to be provided by your health insurance company. A lot of people have that experience of this is documented in, in Michael Moore's movie, Sicko. I've had the experience that they think they have health insurance, but then it turns out that when they need it, suddenly it's not there anymore. And I, I'll give you an example from my own life. I have five children. When the first one was born, um, the insurance company told us 
that the insurance company would not be covering the birth of the child. However, they told me that after she was born. <laughs> so a bill shows up one day in our mailbox for $10,000, and that turns out to be the cost of a healthy birth. This is a complicated birth. She was not premature. Nothing unusual happened in the course of that experience, except for the fact that I had a warm glow on me for a long time <laughs> afterward and, and got to see what a, what a, a beautiful experience that would be. Leaving that aside, I had to pay for that with a $10,000 unexpected bill. One of the nice things about the current law is it says you can't do that anymore. We're, we're setting up standards so that there's the high uh, premium with the high coverage, the medium premium with the medium coverage, the low premium with the low coverage, and there's no cheating premium with the cheating coverage. That's <laughs> over. So you wouldn't have the experience anymore under any uh, policy that's approved uh, for the benefit of these programs, because now there have to be a certain number of benefits that are included, at least a minimum. That means that you get the coverage that you deserve. And the benefit of that is not only that we stop faking people out, not only that we stop surprising people, but, but also that we make sure that the care is actually there. A lot of people who are faced with that kind of shortfall can't work out of that problem the way that you do. When I was first in Congress, I had a lot of trouble with my colleagues. They didn't believe what you were saying. They thought, well, anybody can go to the emergency room. Uh, but the fact is they're not going to give you chemotherapy in the emergency room. That doesn't work that way. So we had to set up a website called namesofthedead.com. And I went on the floor of the house and I invited people to go to that website and to tell their stories of people who thought they had coverage, didn't have coverage, and someone who they knew and loved died as a result of that. And these are some of the most tragic stories I've ever heard in my entire life. Not, not just you know children losing parents, but parents losing children. Uh, sad, sad stories. And the nice thing about it is that we are moving toward the end of that. You know, of the things that we've discussed here today, we're making so little progress so far. I'm fighting hard every day for a higher minimum wage, for better benefits, for better working conditions for people who work. But here's a problem that we're on our way to solving. We're on our way to solving it and seeing that almost everybody in this country can see a doctor who's sick and health care is affordable. And you see the nonstop attack, attack, attack for literally years on end to try to prevent that from happening. And you know, we'll just have to fight back. That's all I can say. What's the next question? Um, the next question is for Rick Navy. Daddy Hagley. Oh, okay. All right. So Frank Warlow. Warbo? set up the districts in such a way to favor one party. Um, in the case of Florida, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and several other large, Texas, and several other large states, the Republican Party. Um, and also as a result of the enormous influence of corporate money, uh, which is entirely one-sided and comes in essentially only to support Republican candidates. As a result of that, even though in the last election, Democrats got more votes than Republicans did uh, for the House of Representatives nationwide, nevertheless, Republicans ended up with more seats in the House of Representatives than Democrats did. Specifically, the Republicans ended up with 234 seats, and Democrats ended up with 201 seats. Um, I'm a Democrat, proud to be a Democrat. Uh, and I represent a party that I think has tried hard during my lifetime to fight for better working 
conditions for people. A lot of Democrats who I know feel that we just don't do enough for the people who need to work in this country. You know, we give them an extremely modest in the ways that it's even not to put you above the poverty line. We take a stab at giving them a safe workplace. We give people time and a half for overtime, although the Republicans in the House actually voted against that to eliminate time and a half for overtime only two months ago. And I, I just think that we need to do more. And it, it's very difficult. There are some things where you can bridge the gap. Um, as I indicated before, even though I'm a Democrat, I've passed more amendments in the, in the, in the House of Representatives than anybody uh, since the beginning of the year. I was sworn in on January 3rd, so this is the year that counts. Um, and, and that's because we do occasionally find issues where I can find a way to bridge the gap without compromising my principles. To give you one example, last week uh, we passed the law in the House that I wrote to end torture by the military. Uh, interestingly enough, um, thank you. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle found were uncomfortable defending torture. You live and you learn, right? Uh, another uh, amendment that we passed last week uh, was an amendment to move $10 million out of the war budget and spend it instead on prostate cancer. Uh, you know, I, I'm more interested in making efforts to keep people alive, and I was very happy to have that opportunity. Um, again, the Republicans looked at that, they said, given the enormously bloated Pentagon budget, do we really want to have to explain why we can't have $10 million more to re for research on a disease that kills so many people each year? They just couldn't argue against it. So we, we got our way. Um, there is that possibility. But when you're talking about basic bread and butter issues, when you're talking about wages, when you're talking about employment, when you're talking about benefits, when you're talking about health care, there's this a staggering, enormous chasm um, that, that I find very difficult to bridge despite my best efforts. Um, time and time again, we found that sweet spot where the Democrats support a Grayson proposal because they have one thing in their head and the Republicans support it for an entirely different reason, but the result is we get it done. To give you another example, how many of you are uh, how many of you uh, are in favor uh, of? Um, it's not a fair question. I'll, 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 <laughs> not a fair question. Uh, many people in Florida are against offshore drilling. Uh, we, we have 70 million visitors to the state each year, uh, and we're concerned about the possibility that if there were some kind of problem, like the deep oil spill and was right off of our shore, it would kill our beaches possibly for years. And that people would stop visiting Florida, it would no longer be the beautiful state that it is. Well, we had a bill to expand offshore drilling that the Republicans proposed last month. And I put in an amendment that said that in certain areas you need the state's approval in order to have offshore drilling. The Democrats supported my amendment because many Democrats are environmentalists feel the way I do. We want to have a protection of nature. We want to make sure that we don't kill the golden goose that represents the tourist business in Florida. Many Republicans support it because they saw it as a state's rights amendment. They saw it as, as a federalism amendment, meaning that they want to give more power to the states, less power to the federal government. I don't care. They voted for it. <laughs> But with regard to the issues that we're talking about tonight, it's very difficult. I will continue to work with, with them over time, see if I can wear them down. Uh, but, but the fact is that the kinds of issues we're talking about, the economic bread and butter issues, are ones where they tend to favor the multinational corporations like Walmart and like McDonald's, and they are less concerned about the little guy. Next question. Okay, next question is from Wanda Ramos. Oh, <laughs> First, I want to say you're my hero. Thank you. And here's my question How is the proposal for uh, uh, wages that you've been um, doing will cover workers that will get an increase in minimum wage, but then the employer will cut the hours 
just to make up for that increase in the wage? Well, as, as the professor said, I, I think that that's not going to happen very often, if at all. I mean, the, the bottom line is that employers don't hire people out of grace. They don't hire people out of generosity. They hire people when they need them. Um, and if, if you are operating, let's say, McDonald's, and you need 27 people to keep it running, you need 27 people to keep it running. And that's the way it is. You know, if you, if you cut out uh, some of these people, or if you take the part-time, full-time workers, and you make them into part-time workers, you end up with no French fries. <coughs> you know, how sad would that be? So, so the uh, you know we have to get away. From, look, I have run a number of businesses in my life. Okay, I, I started a, a telephone business that was very successful when public. Um, I ran a law business for many years. Right now, I'm in charge of a congressional office. And I will tell you that we don't hire people just for the sake of hiring people. We hire the people whom we need. Um, we hire the best people we can find, and we hire them for as much time as we need them to do their work. So I, I think that it, it's really a, a misconception to think that that's going to happen. Now, what we have seen already, because employers actually have said this publicly, is that rather than having 50 people full time, what they're doing is, in order to gain the system, they're going to 70 people part-time. So they have the same number of total hours, but they're spreading them among a larger number of people, because that way they won't be responsible for paying the full-time employees the benefits they deserve. We have to crack down on that. I, I am co-sponsoring a bill in Congress introduced by a congresswoman from Illinois, Jan Schakowsky, that cracks down on that and says you can't take a full-time worker, make that worker into a part-time worker, and then pretend you owe that worker nothing. Okay, the, next, the next question is from Roger McDonald. Is Roger here? somehow make millions or even billions of dollars in profit because they give them their patents, their licenses, their trademarks, and all this intellectual property, and they have these offshore companies charge them for these things. And the result of that is that they have deductions on their U.S. income taxes, and they set these companies up in places where they don't have to pay any corporate income taxes. So, you know, one of the fundamental imbalances in the economy right now is that corporations are paying next to nothing corporate income taxes compared to the historical norm. The historical norm is that corporations have paid 4% of the gross national product as their income taxes. And we came very close to zeroing that out last year. We came very close to zero. In fact, for the last three years, the rate's been only 1%. So 
So corporations are successfully avoiding historically what has been 75% of their tax burden, while ordinary people pay more and more and more, unless you happen to be Mitt Romney. <laughs> In which case, you only pay 14%. Um, and even that seems like too much to him, I'm sure. Uh, so, so, I mean, the, 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 primer, the first question, the, 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 the question uh, initially is how do you get these corporations to pay their fair share of the social burden, uh, paying for a national defense, uh, paying for unemployment insurance, uh, paying for the things that they should be paying for to start with. But then, you know, to get back to your question, uh, the, the answer, I think, is that uh, we, what we see is that that occurs, what you're describing occurs only when the employees are organized um, and they have a way to influence the actions of the company. Uh, what you're describing does, in fact, occur in Germany, because in Germany, by law, the employees have to have representation on the board of directors. In every major company in Germany, the workers get to choose people on the board of directors. So the result of that is that uh, the workers have a say in the entire pay structure of the company from the top all the way to the bottom. And I think that if we had a system like that, you'd start to see results like what you're describing. And by the way, as I indicated before, Germany is one of the most competitive economies in the entire world. Germany has an enormous trade surplus. In fact, the largest trade surplus in the world in terms of the size of its economy. Uh, they, they, they produce and export roughly $300 billion more each year than they import. Uh, by every scale, German workers are extremely productive, very competitive. And somehow giving them that say in how the uh, spoils are divide, divided within each company only motivates them that much more. So, you know, I, I think that what you're describing when you compare our system to Germany indicates that we're not doing enough in every respect to make sure that the money that comes into companies is being distributed in a manner that the people working there help to create. Okay, next question is from Larry Kidd. Larry Kidd here? Larry. Larry. Hello. Um, first, I'd like to say that I consider myself lucky that you're my congressman, and I appreciate everything you do. Florida is one of the worst uh, states in the nation as far as wage theft, which is money that uh, companies or bosses steal from the workers through many different ways. Most workers in the state of Florida, Florida do not know how to contact the United States Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division, even though they have an office right here in Orlando. The question is, how can we make the Wage and Hour Office more accessible and responsive to the workers. Thank you. Well, if, you, if anybody has any difficulty in responsiveness, I invite you to get in touch with our office. Uh, by the end of the evening, when we finish up, I'll make sure that you have all the contact information that we need for our office. If you feel that any federal employee is not doing his job and not responding to your needs, then you should let us know. Uh, I think that's one of our fundamental responsibilities, whether you're talking about veterans' benefits or Social Security or wage and hour determinations or otherwise, we're here to help you. Uh, and I, I think we have a good record in doing so. With regard to the other element, how can we let people know, that is a constant struggle. You know, there, there are many people who, a staggering number of people who are qualified to be earned income tax credit, don't know about it, never apply for it, never get the money that they're entitled to. And there are many other benefits that are, in fact, like that. There's a, a big gap between what people are eligible for by law and what they actually know about. And it's a struggle. Uh, recently, the, the, uh, the National Labor Relations Board promulgated a rule that would have required all employers, whether they're unionized or not, to put information like what you're describing in the workplace. And they were promptly sued by the Chamber of Congress. And the Republicans then tried to shut down the National Labor Relations Board entirely uh, in part because of this. Um, I think people should know about their rights. Uh, we do our best in meetings like this to make sure that we disseminate information like that. 
Um, and we do our best with regard to the resources that we have available for the benefit of what you're describing. Um, you know, we, we have to hope that, that significant efforts on the part of the Obama administration and on the part of the NLRB and the Department of Labor to inform people of their rights are not frustrated by organized uh, multinational corporate lobbies uh, that want to keep people in the dark. But we do the best we can in the circumstances, and I hope that we have many partners in that regard. Thank you for doing what you do uh, to advise people in non-union workplaces about what rights that they have. Next up is Jeannie Donahue. Is she here? There she is. Uh, uh, number one, you, you are a great hero. Well, say it louder. I don't think people heard that. <laughs> Balance the two major parties. Yes, let me just explain. Thank you um, let, me, let me explain what, what, what you're referring to. The, the way that the House of Work Representatives is organized is that the Republicans are in control. They have the numbers right now, they outnumber the Democrats by 33 or 35 votes, depending upon vacancies. And um, the result of that is that there's, there are two parallel uh, forces involved. The Republicans have what they call their whip operation, and the Democrats have what we call our whip operation. And I, I, believe it or not, I am actually part of the leadership, even though it's only my second term in Congress, I'm part of the leadership uh, of the Democratic Party uh, in that regard. Uh, I was chosen as my regional whip. That means that all of the, I'm responsible for whipping into line. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all of the Democratic uh, representatives from uh, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. So that's my responsibility. Um, it, it's, it, it's difficult because it, we are only activated from time to time. There's very few votes where these days the leadership feels like fighting. Honestly, you know, many congressmen, Democratic congressmen in particular, are sort of spirited right now. They're demoralized. It's true. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's obvious from watching the institution, without the numbers, many Democrats feel like there's limits to what they can accomplish. I don't feel that way. I think we've done a lot. I think that people who feel that they can't get anything done in Congress should be in Congress. That's my feeling. But the fact is that each side has its own whip operation, and the Democratic whip operation is very rarely activated. And we need to find out where people stand on the issues, where, where Republicans stand as well as Democrats stand on things like cutting Social Security benefits privatizing Medicare, repealing Obamacare, immigration reform. You know, major issues that everybody knows about, unless the Democratic leadership says, Alan, go and check, I have no license to do that even within my region. So the result of that is that we have organized citizens through a citizen whip website, citizenwhip.com, I think, isn't that right? Citizenwhip.something. Uh, to sign up uh, and then contact both parties, members of Congress, both Democrat and Republican, and say to them, do you support immigration reform? Do you support gun safety? Do you support a variety of, of different issues? And we feel that by forcing them to respond to people, and they, they do actually, I mean, when you write to a Republican member, you usually write back. They, you know, they, they realize that there's no point in ignoring people that they just get angry with you. So they write something back. And then we collect all these responses, and it, it's turned out to be very interesting. To our surprise, uh, we found a number of Republicans who were willing to go on the record through this project and say that they were against cuts in Medicare and Social Security. The general layout is that in Congress, most of the Democrats are against these cuts, and most Republicans are in favor of the cuts, so they just don't want to talk about it. But through our project, we were able to put Republicans on the record saying that they were against cuts in Social Security, against the cost of living cut that the president himself proposed in his budget, um, and, and against privatizing Medicare, which is basically just 
taking away all the benefits, replacing with a check that isn't big enough to buy coverage that you need under Medicare. And, and that turned out to be a very useful exercise. We, people come to our website, sign up for that project. It's um, not related to our campaign. It's independent of our campaign. And the result of that is that we find out useful things. When we found out that some Republicans were against these cuts, it made national news. We put out a news release saying, we received these letters from our citizen whips. Uh, we, we gave them to the media. And the media saw that we were right and that that was news. I mean, to say that a Republican is against Social Security Medicare cuts, it's like, it's like man bites dog. <laughs> you know, it's not dog bites man, it's man bites dog. So that turned out to be national news, and that's what we've been doing in that regard. Okay, next question comes from Timothy Murray. Right. I must say, the last minute was super intelligent. <laughs> this is going to be a great question. <laughs> Again, you are one of my heroes as well. I probably won't pass it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, today at the Orlando Sentinel, there was a report of an outbreak of measles in the Orlando Attractions area. Um, and again, just to reiterate about burn sick time, don't you feel that something like earned sick time in Orange County would help protect the workers at our attractions and their very low wage as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, what people understand, what people fail to understand sometimes is that there's all sorts of practical consequences to anybody can tell. You know, uh, we were, most of us are way past the point where we can ignore our bodies. You know, our bodies are constantly telling us things through aches and pains and otherwise, um, and, and trying to let us know things. And in fact, these have consequences. If you have a general deterioration of the standard of health in the community, the standard of public health, because, for instance, let's say, hypothetically, the governor zeroes out the health budget and, cut, and, and eliminates every free health clinic in the entire state so that they won't compete with his own health chain to lend it, hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, there are results. You know, I, have, I have five children, all right? And when, when one of my children gets sick in school, he or she has to stay home. Uh, that's the way it goes. I mean, my, my wife could drop my child off to school, one of my eight-year-olds that's at, twins are eight years old, drop the child off to school. An hour later, she has to go and pick him up because he's got a step and the teacher doesn't want that child to infect any other child or otherwise be uncomfortable at school and make things worse. And, and yet, even though we, we, we say children can't go to school, we say sick adults have to work. That doesn't make any sense. You know, so, so the result of that is that we end up potentially in Orlando being tarred with a, a measles outbreak, which is you know, entirely avoidable. Uh, we, we end up potentially with people getting the sense that when they come to Orlando and they go to a restaurant, and they have the salad, the salad was prepared by somebody who you know, had a cold or pneumonia or the flu or you know. so, so, you know, we, we of all people, since we rely upon the kindness of others, the 70 million people that come and visit us each year, we have to make sure that we maintain the highest possible health standards in order to make sure that people are comfortable to coming here, not just living here, but even just living here. Okay, the last question of the evening, because we're running out of time, is Michael Rosenblum. Where are you at, Michael? Right here. Right. All right. Congressman Wilson, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I heard you say earlier that uh, you enjoy going to the airport every uh, week, uh, coming back and forth from work. Uh, but, and I understand that the airport is in your district. I don't know if you understand if uh, what's going on with the Transportation Security Administration, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, which uh, the Greater Orlando Airport Authority, with the help of one of your colleagues, uh, John Micah, is trying to privatize our uh, organization here at Orlando International Airport. <coughs> My question to you, sir, is,
do you know anything about this? And what's your view if you're for or against it? And is there any way that you could, with your power in Congress, could step in and try to stop this altogether? Because it's going to cost people, uh, hundreds of people their uh, jobs and benefits. All right, I, I, I know all about it, I, I, and I'm entirely against it. Uh, let me just explain. But first, I have to tell you something. I don't like going to the airport every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am the only member of Congress with five children in school. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to cry on your shoulder, but in fact, logistically, <laughs> it's sort of a difficult thing for me to go to the airport every week and to leave a wife and five children. It's not something I look forward to. Honestly, it's an exciting job, and I'm really glad to have it. But the fact is that it is difficult to, to make all that work out. But get, getting back to your question, um, yeah, I'm, I'm completely aware of that. Just by way of background, uh, the, 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 the TSA is the government agency responsible for airport security. Uh, the TSA, when it was created, was created as a sort of a Republican experiment in union bashing. Uh, well, virtual, the great majority of federal employees uh, are, are, are parts of unions. Uh, the TSA was created uh, in order to be a sort of an anti-union exception to the rest of the federal establishment, even DOD employees, uh, out of the theory that there would be some kind of conflict between union rights and the rights to organize versus security. And I never could see that conflict. I actually think the system works better uh, when the rights of the employees are taken care of, but and in respect of, uh, but the the TSA was established as a sort of anomaly in the law, uh, where initially workers didn't have the right to organize at all. Then, uh, through the efforts of many Democrats, including myself, uh, we got past that point. Uh, the workers at TSA were allowed to organize. They had the the right to organize. I was in favor of that. Congressman Michael was against it. You know, to be fair to Congressman Micah, I, you know, on, on many issues we work well together. I think that he's tried as hard as I have, for instance, to get the VA hospital in Lake Nona finished. And I think that that's important, uh, particularly for people who have to drive 200 miles to get decent care at a veterans hospital. But with regard to what you're talking about, what Congressman Micah has proposed, just to explain it to everybody else in the audience, is that we make Orlando an experiment, another experiment, and this experiment is to see um, what would happen if we take these people who act under the color of law. I mean, the TSA people are essentially all right and purpose police officers. All right? We take these people who act under the color of law, and let's just see what happens if instead of having federal employees do those jobs, uh, we have private contractors do those jobs. Now, a private contractor is motivated not by security, but by profit. The private contractor wants to get as much money as he can out of the government and give as little as possible in return uh, and the difference is called profit. So I regard that as dangerous, literally dangerous. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's dangerous to replace federal employees uh, with private contractors in the same way that I think it would be dangerous to replace police officers mm -hmm. with private contractors. We don't do that either. <laughs> So I'm against it. Um, we, we actually have prepared a letter uh, to the airport explaining that I'm against it. And what we're doing is to make sure that nothing is done to accelerate that process. Um, you know, I can't promise you that we're going to be able to stop it. But I can't promise you that we're trying to stop it. And that's all I can do. All right, I guess we're out of time for questions. I did want to say one more thing to you. Uh, the other congressman who represents downtown Orlando uh, is Congresswoman Cora Brown. I don't know how many of you know her. Um, I had a conversation with her before I was ever elected to Congress. And um, she, she endorsed me, and that's one of the reasons why I won my first grant for Congress in 2008. And I was very happy to have her support. Still, I'm happy to work well together with her. I think we're a good team in many respects. I asked her in a private conversation where there was just the two of us, nobody else was listening. I said to her, what's the best thing about the job? Because I had never had a job before. I wasn't like anything in the first half century of my life. I didn't know what it was all about. 
So I didn't know what she would say. I said, I was thinking maybe she'll say the best part of the job is that little train that you get to ride uh, from our offices over to the Capitol. Yes, there actually is a little train that you can ride, believe it or not. Or, or she'd say, uh, you know, those foreign trips that you can take at taxpayer expense, those are called congressional delegation trips. I thought she'd say something really nice like that. And, but she did, she did. In this private conversation that just two of us had, she said, the best part of the job is all the good that you can do. And that is something I have on my mind every week when I go up to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming.